it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Hello, welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Lichardella. This week, who is Joe Manchin and what does he want? We'll talk to his friend and former Senate colleague Heidi Heitkamp about the future of infrastructure, voting rights, the filibuster and a whole lot more. And thousands of Afghans who helped in America's longest war are facing death threats from the Taliban. We'll speak to a leading military lawyer about their plight. But first... Negotiations aimed at reaching a bipartisan infrastructure agreement between President Biden and Republicans, led by West Virginia's Shelley Moore Capito, collapsed this week. The two sides walked away, citing irreconcilable differences on exactly how much new money to spend. And while that gap was closing a bit, they could not get on the same page on things like tax hikes to pay for it. And the last offer that I got from the president had four tax increases in it. We've missed a real opportunity here for at least 20 Republicans to join with the other Democrats to pass a, the most robust infrastructure package that we could have. But after a quickie divorce, they immediately started dating again. A gang of 20 senators evenly drawn from both sides taking up the baton and at least 10 Republicans need to vote with Biden's Democrats to overcome the filibuster and pass the bill through the Senate. Another bipartisan grouping of 10 senators say they have agreed on a compromise, but that does not get 260 votes just yet. Joe Biden, meanwhile, is looking at Plan B, or is it Plan C now? Before heading overseas, he was on the phone to Democrat Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to discuss passing the bill with just 51 votes through that loophole known as budget reconciliation. Democratic representatives like Pramila Jayapal are all for that option. This is a party that's not interested in delivering for the people, so we should just move ahead right now get the budget resolutions going and do a budget res uh, reconciliation bill, big, bold and fast. So the question now is whether moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin, who've been pushing for a less ambitious, less expensive bipartisan bill, feel as though they have exhausted all other options. Joe Biden is overseas until the end of next week, so the White House reportedly sees little downside in trying chairs. Yeah, there's another bill doing the rounds as well, John. The House Problem Solvers Caucus. There are bipartisan a group of 58 representatives. They've just voted on and endorsed a $1.25 trillion eight-year package with $500 billion in new spending. That's more than the Senate GOP was offering in that first deal. So that could potentially be going somewhere. It's not like bipartisanship is impossible either. Just this week, the Senate passed the Innovation and Competition Act on a 68 to 32 vote. We're talking nearly $250 billion worth of scientific research over five years to bolster competitiveness against China. And all they had to do was take a plan to build a $100 billion research and development hub for emerging technologies, then cut that down to $29 billion, and then saddle that bill with about $220 billion worth of pork and pet projects for a whole bunch of senators. And then you sell it as being anti-China, and then you give Joe Biden no credit for it at all, and then, hey presto John, you got a bill! It's so easy! <laughs> the only problem is this infrastructure bill has Joe Biden written all over it, and in particular, Biden is refusing to pay for it by any means other than by raising some taxes. <laughs> But key moderate Mitt Romney is insisting that Republicans will not agree to tax increases. And Rob Portman has also said taxes would be a huge mistake. They are both involved with that compromise you just described a couple of seconds ago. If you ain't got Romney or Portman, you ain't got yourself 60 votes in the Senate. So realistically, this standoff is continuing. Indeed. Meanwhile, Joe Manchin burst the bubble of a lot of progressive members of his party and the civil rights community this week, penning an op-ed in West Virginia's Charleston Gazette Mail, explaining why he plans to vote against the For the People Voting Rights Act. His argument essentially is you cannot counter a partisan Republican attack on voting rights at the state level with a partisan Democratic bill at the federal level. He says congressional action on federal voting rights legislation must be the result of both Democrats and Republicans coming together. Kumbaya, Chaz. Apparently. It's Manchin's view, John, that since the right to vote is fundamental to American democracy, that protecting that right should never be done in a partisan manner. 
Now, that'd be news to the Republicans after the Civil War, who passed a whole series of civil rights bills securing rights for black people, including voting rights, with this many Republican votes and this many Democratic votes. Goose eggs. It's a good thing Joe Manchin was an emperor back then. Indeed. The <laughs> For the People Act, which Joe Manchin originally co-sponsored, would have transformed America's system of election, including national standards for automatic voter registration, same-day registration and mail-in voting, independent redistricting to prevent gerrymandering is in there as well. It also overhauls campaign finance and it imposes tough new ethics measures in areas around lobbying and fundraising. After talks with a group of civil rights leaders who all support HR1, including friend of the show Al Sharpton, Senator Manchin was unmoved this week, but also optimistic of future progress. What we had was a great, we had a respectful, we had a very informative, and it was a very good conversation that we had, and as a starting of a good relationship, it really was. Manchin's optimism may or may not be vindicated, probably not. He is still supporting the second voting rights bill waiting to hit the Senate floor. That's the John Lewis Act, which is narrower in scope and essentially seeks to prevent the further erosion of rights rather than to expand them. That bill, partially written by and named for the civil rights icon and former congressman John Lewis, who died last year, would restore a measure from the original 1965 Voting Rights Act, which was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013. That one required States, most of them in the Deep South, with a history of infringing voting rights on the basis of race, to get Justice Department pre-clearance for any changes to local or state election laws. Yeah, I don't know why Joe Manchin would be so optimistic. Mitch McConnell has already said he isn't going to support the bill that Joe Manchin's pushing. There's no threat to the voting rights law. It's against the law to discriminate in voting on the basis of race already. And so I think it's unnecessary. So the John Lewis Act isn't going to get to 60 votes either. Mm. The problem for the Democrats, though, is far greater than that. Manchin has also said that he will not vote to weaken or eliminate the filibuster. If anything, his position is hardening on that question. And if he means that, that could well spell the end for the Democrats' chances of passing any of Biden's remaining agenda. The lefties did not take that well, tweeting out things like... Is anyone else cripplingly depressed about the imminent collapse of American democracy and the ecosystem that sustains human life? Or is that just a me thing? Others like House Rep Jamal Bowman attacked Manchin directly. And now Joe Manchin is doing everything in his power to stop democracy. But not only are statements like that possibly counterproductive, after all, Trump won Manchin's state of West Virginia by 40 points. <laughs> Democrats criticising Manchin are not going to be hurting him much. But it's also not really fair. It's an open secret that Manchin isn't the only Democrat who opposes the For the People Act or opposes eliminating the filibuster. It's just a number of cowardly Democrats are letting Manchin take the heat for them. Also, for all his flaws, Manchin has at least been consistent. Back in 2017, when the Republicans held all three branches of government, a bipartisan group of senators, including 31 Democratic senators, wrote Trump a heartfelt note supporting the filibuster. They said, We oppose any effort to curtail the existing rights and prerogatives of senators to engage in full, robust and extended debate. Is that what they're doing? And now, out of all those Democratic senators, only Manchin hasn't changed his mind. And finally, you can't blame Manchin for being obsessed with bipartisanship. Voters are as well. 85% of voters say it's very or somewhat important for legislation to have bipartisan support. Although admittedly, 79% of Democrats thought Republicans should compromise, but only 48% of Democrats thought Democrats should compromise. And 78% of Republicans thought Democrats should compromise, but only 41% of Republicans thought Republicans should compromise. So. Maybe, John, we are all filthy hypocrites <laughs> and deserve each other. I don't know whether to blame politics or human nature or maybe we're talking about the same thing. Either way, let's find out who is this Joe Manchin guy anyway and why has he got this fixation with bipartisanship? Chris Wallace on Fox News this week suggested that his stance is rather naively playing into the hands of Republican obstructionists. By taking it off the table, haven't you empowered Republicans to be obstructionists? 
I don't think so, because we have seven brave Republicans that continue to vote for what they know is right and the facts as they see them, not worrying about the political consequences. I believe there's a lot more of my Republican colleagues and friends that feel the same way. I'm just hoping they are able to, to rise to the occasion to, to defend our country and support our country and make sure that we have a democracy for this republic of all the people. I'm, I'm just very hopeful that I see good signs. Hope springs eternal, I suppose, Chaz. Joining us is Joe Manchin's former Democratic Senate colleague, Heidi Heidkamp, a friend and fellow moderate from the great state of North Dakota. Senator, welcome back to Planet America. It is always good to connect with you guys. So what is Joe Manchin's deal? He's got to be pretty naive, hasn't he, to believe in bipartisanship after the last 15 years or so of hyperpartisanship. Well, I mean, today um, you're hearing that there might be a bipartisan infrastructure deal. I've always predicted that infrastructure, if there's one place we can get bipartisanship, it's infrastructure. I always say it's the Oprah of legislation. You get a car and you get a car. In this case, you get a bridge and you get a road and you get a hospital. And so um, there's something in infrastructure for everyone. Plus, Republican governors love it. The public loves it. And I think that they don't want to be seen as obstructing investment in America. I think the tougher stuff is voting rights, um, you know, anything that touches on the cultural or racial divides in this country. But you know, I find it interesting that everybody's criticizing Joe Manchin. But why isn't there more focus on the fact that you can't find 10 Republicans who really care about this issue enough to sit down and negotiate it? Um, you know, and that's really tragic. In the past, Republicans have really led a lot of great civil rights reforms, not to mention, you know, the Civil War, which was led by Republicans. Um, and so uh, they are really losing, I think, the moral high ground. And the focus on Joe Manchin really takes away from the fact that the Republican Party has walked away in our country from equality issues. The psychology of the situation is pretty clear, though. I imagine it's clear to Joe Manchin as well. He's essentially unilaterally surrendered control of his agenda to the Republicans. If they don't cooperate with him, he has no other play. Shouldn't he have kept his cards slightly closer to his chest than this? You know, Joe's a pretty good negotiator, and Joe's not afraid to say, well, tried that, didn't work, got to, got to retrench. And, you know, when you're, you're Joe's age, and he didn't want to run again, I, I, I'm sure the friends of the program know that Joe's like one of my dearest friends. He didn't really did not want to run again. And everyone knew that the only way you could retain a Democratic seat in West Virginia is for Joe Manchin to run. And, and so this idea, I mean, the Democrats owe the entire uh, majority in the Senate to Joe, um, which isn't to say he should overplay his hand or, or be more significant than any one senator. But I think he would like to fix things in his lifetime and to suggest that that he's been naive or doesn't understand what's going on, I think is not to understand the dynamics of the place, but also not to understand Joe Manchin as a human being and as a, as a civic leader. So help us to try and understand Joe Manchin, Senator. What makes him tick? What is he actually trying to achieve through all this bipartisanship talk? I think he's trying to restore the reputation of the Senate. I think he's trying to uh, pass legislation that has some level of permanency. You know, one of the things that, that you see when you don't have bipartisanship is these huge swings. You know, let's say uh, in four years, the Republicans have control, uh, effective control of the government. That means that their agenda gets promoted, but at, by by the narrowest of margins. And I think what he's trying to do is say, principled compromise needs to come back into the public agenda. It's not going to come back into the public agenda if you cut corners on issues that you care about. You've got to do the hard work of governing. Anyone who thinks that he is going to be played in this deal doesn't understand Joe Manchin. He's not afraid to say, tried that, uh, tried to make it work. I'm I'm going to rethink uh, what I've been what I've been doing. As you say, Sandra, you know Joe Manchin pretty well. So let me ask: Is Joe Manchin right now relishing this attention and influence, or do you think the heat's not really to his taste? I don't think he's relishing anything. The heat that he is getting from the left and from uh, the Democrats is really overwhelming. And I've been in that spot, um, not to the same extent that Joe's in that spot, but 
I think what he's trying to do is live by a set of principles. And when he decided to run again, um, against uh, his better judgment, I think he decided I'm going to run and be the kind of senator that I would want to represent me. And again, I mean, why are we so focused on Joe Manchin? The only reason why everybody's so focused on him is because he's a Democrat. If he were Republican, it would be a, be like a big deal. Why aren't we focused on the fact that 10, 10 Republicans don't want to guarantee voting rights in this country. 10 Republicans don't want to equalize and improve the tax code in this country. 10 Republicans don't want to do the work of, uh, of this country. And you take a look, I, I think the worst vote that's happened um, in, in since, since this Congress has been the January 6th commission. That, that should have been a vote of conscience, but the fact that only six Republicans were willing to step up and actually vote for it tells you that we are, that, that this is a party, a Republican party, that's seriously broken with no agenda. And Senator, how would you characterize the relationship between Joe Manchin and President Biden? Do these guys get along? Joe gets along with everyone. I always tell people there's no, there's no more friendly, gregarious, um, uh, uh, charming person in the United States Senate than Joe Manchin. And people always say, what do you, what can you say about Joe? I said, he's Italian. So just remember that he also has a long memory if people um, don't treat him right, but, but he will always give somebody the benefit of the doubt. And, and I think that um, it doesn't hurt the president, uh, President Biden, to be able to say, look, I can't go that far. I don't have the votes. Um, and I think that Biden, by impulse, is a compromiser. He's somebody who is looking for what deal we can do. I think you're going to see that in the infrastructure package that passes. Um, and, and so I think, I think that Joe gets along with everyone. There's never any hard feelings with Joe Manchin. And I think that he and uh, Joe Biden go back a long way. And, uh, you know, that's a pick up the phone and call people and be very, very candid about what you think kind of relationship. Senator Heidi Heidkamp, we always appreciate your insights and experience. Thank you for joining us on Planet America. You bet. Stay warm. So, even though the odds are now very much against passage of sweeping voting reforms, advocates are not giving up. James Spaulding is with Common Cause, a nonpartisan Democratic watchdog group. He's an election law expert, former senior advisor to congressional Democrats. He was a key player in the passage of the original HR1 voting rights bill. And I asked him if he thinks that Joe Manchin's no vote is essentially a death knell. It is not dead and buried, and we're not going to let one op-ed from one senator bury the most trans transformative and important uh, democracy legislation really in a generation. Again, this bill is made up of three pillars to strengthen and bolster American democracy. One, protect and expand access to the freedom to vote. Two, end the corrupting influence of big money in politics. And three, end corruption by cleaning up uh, the ethics rules in our country. So one op-ed by Senator Manchin uh, is not gonna end our efforts. Um, and I'll remind viewers that Senator Manchin actually co-sponsored this bill uh, in the last Congress back in 2019. And last but not least, I'll just mention that if you look at his op-ed and you read it carefully, he, he critiques the process. He would like Republicans to come along, but he doesn't say anything about the substance of the bill. Not one, but two former presidents returned to the political arena this week. Donald Trump gave a speech at the North Carolina Republican Party conference and it was the usual litany of false claims about the election being stolen, an attack on America's top infectious diseases expert Anthony Fauci thrown in for good measure and he had this tease for the Tar Heel State audience about running again in 2024. We're going to lay the groundwork for making sure that Republicans once again carry the great state State of North Carolina in a, a number, a year that I look very much forward to, 2024. Meanwhile, Barack Obama launched a scathing attack on the Republicans that he says failed to uphold traditional institutions following the election of Donald Trump in 2016. The degree to which uh, we did not see that Republican establishment say, hold on, time out, that's not acceptable, that's not who we are, but rather be cowed into 
accepting it, and then finally culminating in uh, January 6th. Now, not that long ago, former presidents tended to shun the spotlight and only re-emerged to add their star power to apolitical issues like disaster relief, but not anymore. Just as Barack Obama campaigned heavily against Republicans in 2016, 2018 and 2020, as a part he saw it of defending his legacy, including health care reform, Donald Trump is also staying very, very politically active, including the plans he announced this week to hit the road later in the year with disgraced former Fox News host Bill O'Reilly for a speaking tour which promises to provide a never-before-heard inside view of his administration. In a statement, President Trump says they will be wonderful but hard-hitting sessions. But additionally, it will be fun, fun, fun for everyone who attends. Whoa, that is a lot of fun, John. I'm having fun already, Chad. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Obviously, there's always a different flavour with Trump potentially running again in 2024. And he's already started to build his new collection of catchphrases. The time has come for America and the world to demand reparations and accountability from the Communist Party of China. And all nations should work together to present China a bill for a minimum of $10 trillion to compensate for the damage they've caused. And that's a very low number. The damage is far, far greater than that. As a first step, all countries should collectively cancel any debt they owe to China as a down payment on reparations. So, make them pay might be the new build that wall mm. and cancel China's debt might be the new we'll make Mexico pay for it. <laughs> you heard it here first. I'm surprised he's not suggesting that China build the wall. They are good at that, historically. Oh, yes, They're right. very good at that. <laughs> the most attention, though, given to Trump's speech related to the former president's trousers. And they did look a bit weird. Zoom in and it looks a bit weirder. And that got them talking on social media. The hashtag Trump Pants was trending on Twitter and a breakfast telly was captivated. You do not see a zipper here. Nothing. And there's some weird crinkling going on, uh, like, in his lap. It's bizarre. Now, I mean, so, like, take a hard, take a look what, it's if like you a want wetsuit. to. Some it's people like might wetsuit. not want to take a look. Mm -mm. And the late night funsters loved it too. It looks like he bumped into something and his pants deployed an airbag. You know what I'm saying? But look, for those who were hoping that the former president is now so befuddled that he literally can't put his own pants on properly, I'm afraid we have to bust some malarkey. That's a bunch of malarkey! And some poor fact-checker at Snopes was given the unenviable task of going back over Trump's entire appearance with a laser-like focus on the groin region. And they concluded the Trump backward pants claim was false. What a shame. <laughs> Sadly, that was a laughable theory, but not nearly as laughable as this about COVID vaccines. A combination of the protein, which now we're finding has a metal attached to it. I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick because now we think that there's a metal piece to that. There has been people who've long suspected that there was some sort of an interface, yet to be defined, an interface between what's being injected in these shots and all of the 5G towers. Not proven yet, but we're trying to figure out what is it that's being transmitted to these unvaccinated people. Oh my God, just ridiculous. Let's leave aside the fact that this woman is a doctor, but metals don't attract other metals. You need a magnet to do that. And keys are usually made of brass. They're not attracted to magnets anyway. And also, oh, actually I don't even know why I'm bothering because apparently my skepticism has already been debunked. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck too. I got this. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? Yes, I've got some questions. Like, one, do you think we didn't just see what happened? 
Two, why are you acting like you didn't just embarrass yourself? And three, can I please get off this ride? <laughs> malarkey, 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 John. Malarkey, Chaz. <laughs> Vice President Kamala Harris has been handed a number of thorny, if not intractable, issues to deal with. None thornier and less tractable, perhaps, than immigration and border security. This week, Veep Harris set off on a mission to Guatemala and Mexico, her first trip abroad as Vice President, to try and stem the the tide of arrivals at America's southern border at its very source. But it didn't go all that smoothly. First, there was this unconvincing performance in an interview with NBC's Lester Holt, who voiced a common right-wing criticism that Kamala Harris has yet to go to the US-Mexico border. Just quickly put a button. Okay. Do you have any plans to visit the border? I, at some point, you know, I, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole this whole this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I mean I don't I don't understand the point that you're making. Now look, to be fair to Harris, when Biden gave her that job, he was quite specific that the border was not her jurisdiction. He said they asked her to lead our efforts with Mexico and the Northern Triangle and the countries that are going to need help stemming the migration to our southern border. So a beat was not the southern border itself, it was trying to deal with the sources of migration through trips like this one here. But it's not like visiting the border wouldn't still be useful for her job. And Harris acting as if she has no idea why anyone would want her to visit the border, it just seems evasive in my view and possibly indifferent. Yeah, it's a dumb story. And one stupid photo op talking to some people in Kevlar vests and sunglasses would have solved the whole thing. It was an obvious question that she got from Lester Holt. She did not have a good answer. And that's the concern for people who would like to see Kamala Harris become president someday. The fact is, she's often really patchy in interviews, in debates, she's often just bad at politics. And the poor optics in this continued as well. Again, small beer stuff, but Harris's plane was forced to return to Andrews Air Base 25 minutes into the flight to Guatemala because of a technical issue. And then, when she landed, Harris found out that the Guatemalan president had just recorded a bunch of interviews where he essentially said he disagreed with the Biden administration's immigration strategy and he blamed their messaging for the border surge. Yamate says increased border crossings have been caused in part by the change of administrations in Washington. Y el mensaje cambió a... The message changed too. We're going to reunite families and we're going to reunite children. The very next day, the Coyotes were here organizing groups of children to take them to the United States. We asked the United States government to send more of a clear message to prevent more people from leaving. Well, possibly inspired by those remarks, once safely on the ground in Guatemala, Kamala Harris had a pretty blunt warning. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. I believe if you come to our border, you will be turned back. Well, that may have played well south of the border, but it didn't go down at all well back home with progressive Democrats who've been hoping for what they would view as a more humane approach to immigration and border control from the Biden administration. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting... This is disappointing to see. First, seeking asylum at any U.S. border is a 100% legal method of arrival. Second, the U.S. spent decades contributing to regime change and destabilization in Latin America. We can't help set someone, someone's house on fire and then blame them for fleeing. Even more of an issue is just how stark a turnaround Harris's tough talk is from her position when she was a presidential candidate back in 2019. I disagree with any policy that would turn America's back on people who are fleeing harm. I frankly believe that it is contrary to everything that we have symbolically and actually said we stand for. And so I would not enforce a law that would reject people and turn them away without giving them a fair and due process to determine if we should give them asylum and refuge.
We've come a long way from I would not reject people and turn them away without giving them a fair and due process. Yeah, I think those sirens in the background were the flip-flop police <laughs> getting ready, Jazz. <laughs> so, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are both still copying it from the left and the right on this issue. US Customs and Border Protection announced this week that there were over 180,000 reported encounters with illegal immigrants in the month of May. That was the third consecutive month that there have been more than 170,000 border crossings. That hasn't occurred since the year 2000. And in fact, there have already been the most border crossings this fiscal year since 2006, with four months left to go in the fiscal year yet. So those numbers could get quite ugly, especially since the way they're trying to deal with these border crossings is by addressing the root causes, which Harris describes as corruption, violence, poverty, lack of economic opportunity, the lack of climate adaptation, and the lack of good governance. Not sure any of them are going to be going away in a hurry, John. No, indeed not. Now, it's just three months to go until America's military commitment to Afghanistan officially comes to an end. Their withdrawal is due to be completed, of course, on September the 11th, the 20th anniversary of the Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks on the United States that triggered the multi-nation intervention to oust the Taliban, who are providing safe haven to Al-Qaeda. But two decades on... And the Taliban is still there and indeed poised to retake control of even greater areas of Afghanistan. And that is posing serious concerns for the Afghans who helped the United States and allies like Australia too. Particularly, it seems, the interpreters, Chaz. Yeah, the withdrawal is apparently already about half done, but some officials say it could be completed by July, although the final exit of equipment and troops will likely be a little later than that. Either way, the Taliban are not waiting around to replace them. Already, in just four provinces, 26 outposts have surrendered to the Taliban. The Afghans' morale obviously isn't the greatest right now, so each surrender is leading to further surrenders. It's meant the Taliban has secured a lot of territory, weapons and vehicles without even firing a shot. And so this has become an issue for those 18,000 interpreters and helpers who assisted the Allies troops. When you throw in their immediate family members, that makes 70,000 Afghans and even now still 100,000 Iraqis, don't forget them, who are relying on the Americans to get them out of Afghanistan and Iraq alive. Now just to be clear, it is not easy to qualify for this kind of protection. It requires at least two years of faithful service to US forces and then you have to complete a 14-part application process in a COVID-ravaged war zone and you have to be able to demonstrate that your lives are in ongoing and serious danger. It's a tight process, a little too tight maybe. As of a few months ago, it was taking the government about 852 days or two years and three months to process a successful visa application, leaving at least a thousand interpreters to be killed while waiting for their visas to come through. To put that in context, it took about a year less for the Marines mascot Smokes the Donkey to be rescued from Iraq. They made some serious mixed messages sent about whether anyone is going to help these people, John, and the clock is ticking. Sure is. Among those taking up this cause for Afghan interpreters is Margaret Stock. She is one of America's leading experts in immigration and military law, herself a former lieutenant colonel in the military police. Margaret Stock, welcome to Planet America. Thanks for inviting me. We know there is this uh, quite long-standing visa program for interpreters and, and other Afghans who've assisted US forces in their effort there. Uh, why isn't that working currently? Why are we seeing this huge backlog? The program's been dysfunctional for years. I would say more than a decade. It suffers from a lack of funding, a lack of personnel, and a lack of attention of the leadership at the highest levels of the US government that, you know, they just haven't focused on this program as being particularly important. I know the program pretty much came to a halt underneath Trump, but right now, today, how long does it take an applicant to get through the process? Years, many, many years. Uh, and it's fraught with peril. There's multiple bureaucratic steps that the person has to go through. It's frequently the case that the government makes mistakes in processing. Just to give you a typical example, I had a case the other day where the government denied the individual a visa because the company had two names. It had a legal name and a doing business as name. And the State Department denied the visa because they got confused and didn't realize that the company had a doing business name as well as an American legal name. 
So little things like that are torpedoing people's chances of resettling in the United States, and it's quite tragic. Is this uh, failure by design, Margaret, or is it just, as you suggest, starved of resources and it hasn't been a priority and maybe the America's longest war was kind of seen as, well, you know, it, it could just be a never-ending thing. We, we might need those interpreters there in place. Well, there you've put your finger on it. There's a little bit of both. So I would say there's an enormous amount of dysfunction built into the program, but that's because the design is way too complicated. You know, if you're going to design a program that requires multiple different agencies, and in this case, it's basically three different cabinet level agencies in the United States, none of which own the program. So three different cabinet level agencies have to work together to make it work, but not a single one of them is really responsible for it in the end. And then at the same time, there's a lot of people who don't want to resettle these individuals in the United States because the thinking goes they should stay behind and rebuild their country. How much danger are these interpreters currently in? Are they, does everyone in their community know that they have been working with Americans or is there some degree of anonymity about it? Well, they're in terrible danger right now. You know, I'm talking to people on a regular basis and they're hiding. Uh, they know they're being targeted by the Taliban. If you're familiar with the current situation in Afghanistan, you know the Taliban is closing in and taking over rural areas and buying heavy arms and weaponry. And these people are targets. Margaret, is that targeting simply base payback from the Taliban or does do they also have a broader strategic purpose to purge the country of people who are sympathetic to the United States that, that might uh, you know, be a source of intelligence or, or, uh, or uh, eyes on the ground in the future? Well, I'm sure they do. You know, they they understand they, they don't want to... The Taliban wants to take over the country. They don't want a lot of American sympathizers remaining behind. And so they're going to take care of them. You know, it's, it's a common thing that happens at the end of a war. OK, so the processing program isn't working very well at the moment. I believe the UK is just about to airlift all of their translators out. Why couldn't America do the same thing? Just take them to Guam and then process them there at their leisure? We could do exactly the same thing. We have a provision of law called the Parole Authority, P-A-R-O-L-E. It's got nothing to do with criminal parole. It allows the U.S. government to instantly parole any foreigner into the United States. And that means they're given a temporary status, but they're allowed to come here while the government tries to figure out what to do with them, whether they should be allowed to apply for asylum or a special immigrant visa or some other visa that they're eligible for. And we've done this before. The Department of Defense has regularly paroled foreigners, large numbers of them, into the United States. We did so in 1996. We had an operation where we evacuated thousands of Kurds from northern Iraq, and we took them to Guam, and we processed them safely there. And there was no trouble with that, and it was done very quickly. We've also used the parole authority for more mundane purposes when Mount Pinatubo blew up in the Philippines, and we needed to evacuate thousands of American family members and children and so forth who were in the Philippines, we use the parole authority. It's a longstanding provision of American law and it's quick and easy to use, but there has to be the willpower at the highest levels of the Department of Defense, the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security in order to do this. So, Margaret, you and others are sounding the alarm right now. The clock is ticking. There's three months this week until the US withdrawal is finalised. Is this inevitably heading towards a Saigon 75 style chaotic rooftop helicopter departure? Or do you think, sounding the alarm as you are, you will actually be able to come up with some kind of interim measure? Well, I hope they're not going to repeat what happened in Saigon. That was chaotic. And there's no reason why this needs to be similarly chaotic. With the proper planning, the Department of Defense can simply dust off the plans they've used previously for similar paroles, and they could execute. And they're just, they just need the willpower to do that. Out of curiosity, Margaret, what reasons are the administration higher-ups giving for the delay at the moment? Well, the things I'm hearing are, um, you know, these people could be a security risk. You know, we need to vet people more thoroughly. OK, well, you can do that in Guam. You did that previously. I'm um, hearing things like, you know, we should allow the Congressional Special Immigrant Visa Program to work. Well, it's dysfunctional and it hasn't been working and you can't possibly tell me that you're going to be able to process people in the next three months when you haven't been able to do it in more than 10 years correctly. But those are the kinds of things that I'm hearing from people. When President Biden set that 9-11 deadline, was he oblivious to this issue or did he just not care? 
I'm not sure he was oblivious and I'm sure he cares. I think the problem is that when you get into situations like this, you have to have planning from people who understand how the government works and who understand the lessons of history. And it's incumbent upon his advisors to say, Mr. President, this is an issue that you might not have thought about. We need to plan for this. Give us the go ahead to execute. You know, we'll come up with some plans and we'll execute. We need to brief you on this. But part and parcel of pulling American troops out of Afghanistan is pulling out all the people who sympathize with us who are going to face death and destruction once we leave. And it's not just the interpreters and the translators, it's their families. Margaret, some Americans might be wondering, if these people are in such danger, how come they haven't headed to refugee camps already? Why must America be the only place that can provide them with safety? Well, many of them have tried to access refugee camps. A lot of them have fled Afghanistan to try to go to other places, to go to Europe. Uh, to go to Pakistan, to go to India. I mean, they're desperately trying to go somewhere, but many of them trust the United States. And we made promises to them. We said, we will not leave you behind. And I continue to hear from people every day who are clinging to the hope that the US government is gonna deliver on its promises. The government specifically promised these folks, we will not leave you behind. And they were told to stay in Kabul and wait for their visa processing to happen. So they're doing what they're told because they trust the US government. So finally, Margaret, what would you like to see happen in the weeks and months ahead? What do you think is the appropriate course of action? The president needs to appoint a very senior level official to coordinate the evacuation of the supporting individuals and their families to the United States you know, it's not rocket science here. We've done this before. They need to mount an operation similar to the one in 1996 when we evacuated the Kurds. I don't know that they necessarily need to send them to Guam. There's other places that maybe might be more suitable, but the United States of America has the capability, it's got the money, and it's got the moral responsibility to take care of these individuals. And all it takes really is leadership at the highest levels at the Department of Defense to say, you know, it's just not right to leave these people behind. We don't need a fiasco. You know, we don't need a bloodbath. Let's get these folks out. Since we've decided to pull our troops out, we need to pull out the supporting people as well. Margaret Stock, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. The month of May saw another middling jobs result, with 559,000 jobs added, a little under the expected 671,000 jobs. Now, that kind of number would normally be considered massive but I need to remind you of just how big a jobs hole America is in after COVID. They're still 7.7 .7 million jobs behind where they were before the pandemic. They're even further behind if you follow the trend line of where they should be by now. By most estimates, they're about 10 million jobs behind where they should be. The unemployment rate of 5.8% is about 2.3% behind where that should be. And if you consider all the extra people who have dropped out of the workforce, a more indicative unemployment rate would be about 7.3%, which is even further behind. To put all this in context, if employment kept growing at the same rate as the last three months, it would take 14 months to return to February 2020 employment levels. And much longer again, if you're trying to return to the pre-pandemic employment trend. Here is why these figures are making people a bit antsy. This is the participation rate. That's the percentage of people who either have jobs or who want jobs. It slowly rose for a decade after the GFC. Then it crashed when the pandemic hit, but since then, it stayed pretty much still ever since June last year. In fact, this month, the participation rate actually went down. And this despite there being a huge record number of job openings, over 9 million of them. So many jobs waiting to be taken, but people simply aren't bothering. So why is that? We told you last month about the three main theories. One, that workers are still concerned about COVID. Two, that kids who aren't back at school need to be looked after. And three, that Biden's $300 a week supplement for unemployment benefits is disincentivizing people from going back to work. Now, it's only been three months since the economy's been in post-vaccine recovery mode, but some trends are emerging. These are the participation rates for 25 to 54 year olds. Some of these people would undoubtedly be worried about COVID and childcare would be a real concern for many of them as well. So no surprise, the participation rate for them has dropped 3.3% during the pandemic. But look at the participation rates for 20 to 24 year olds. 
These people would have fewer COVID worries, also fewer childcare concerns, but their participation rate has dropped by more than the 25 to 54s, by about 5.1%. Of course, those younger people earn less as well, so they would be more likely to see augmented unemployment benefits be about the same or more than their potential wages. Finally, 16 and 19 year olds would be similar in a lot of ways to the 20 to 24s, except they're less likely to be eligible for unemployment benefits. And what do you know, their participation rate has gone up after the pandemic. So that suggests to me that those unemployment benefits might be having some effect. We won't know for sure, though, for another month or two. That's when the red states will have stopped paying the extra unemployment benefits, while the blue states are going to keep on doing so. There'll be a natural experiment then between those two sides. Either way, there is one big advantage of an undersupply of workers, and that is wages going up. Over the last two months, wage growth for production and non-supervisory workers has gone up at an annualised rate of 8.1%. And when you adjust for the kinds of jobs that are being taken up, wage growth is actually more like at a 9.1% annualised rate, faster than at any period since the early 1980s. In fact, the annualised rate of wage growth over the last three months in the leisure and hospitality sector is 17%. So there's your silver lining. Yes, inflation could be an issue. Last month, it was somewhere between 3.5% and 5%, depending on the stats you use. But as long as that doesn't become too much of a problem, then the workforce might yet end up in a decent shape, John. Imagine that. <laughs> some recent polls of potential Republican presidential nominees for 2024 made for some pretty interesting reading. Former President Donald Trump has just under 50% support to mount a comeback, followed by his former VP Mike Pence, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, and then look at that. Donald Trump Jr. is the fourth most popular Republican nominee, ahead of the likes of Mitt Romney, Nikki Haley, Ted Cruz and Tim Scott. Another poll of Republican primary voters, this one without President Trump in it, sees Don Jr move into third place behind just Pence and DeSantis. Not bad for somebody who, like his dad, has never ever held elected office before. So, could we be about to see a second President Trump? Well, history suggests, while it is entirely possible, it's far from preordained. Following the Revolutionary War for Independence from Great Britain, America's founders were concerned their new democratic system could easily devolve into a hereditary monarchy by another name. Instead of a king as head of state, they chose the title President because it was a relatively humble title. They would preside over the government. Until that time, the title President was mostly used for the head of a college or university like Oxford or Cambridge. But even then, the United States Senate wanted to embellish it and they considered elective majesty, sacred majesty, elective highness, illustrious highness and serene highness before finally recommending His Highness, President of the United States and Protector of their Liberties. In fact, it was to be the first major dispute of the newly formed Congress. The House put its foot down, saying it would be President or Mr. President and nothing more. Thomas Jefferson, who would go on to become America's third president, wrote to General George Washington, who was soon to be elected the first president, warning of the lingering dangers of inherited power. A hereditary aristocracy will change the form of our government from the best to the worst in the world. America's second president, John Adams, was generally a bit more sympathetic to the trappings of aristocracy, while he maintained he disliked and detested hereditary honours, officers, emoluments established by law. I dislike and detest hereditary honours, officers, emoluments established by law. He also added, Mankind has not yet discovered any remedy against irresistible corruption in elections to offices of great power and profit, but making them hereditary. Prophetic words, as it turned out. In 1824, Adam's son, John Quincy Adams, ran for president, and he came second to Andrew Jackson in both the electoral vote and the popular vote. With no candidate claiming a majority, 
the House of Representatives voted and they voted for Adams, making him the first son of a president to himself become president in what Jackson's supporters called a corrupt bargain with Speaker Henry Clay, who'd finished third. It looked dodgy and it would be another half century until another candidate with family ties to the White House was elected president. In 1888, Republican Benjamin Harrison defeated Democrat Grover Cleveland. Harrison was the grandson of America's ninth president, William Henry Harrison, who had only lasted 41 days in office before dying in 1841. The 20th century, though, saw more Americans allowed to vote and increasingly they voted for familiar and familial names. President Theodore Roosevelt's fifth cousin Franklin was elected to the White House 24 years after Teddy left. FDR had married Theodore's niece Eleanor, his own fifth cousin once removed, although the two presidents Roosevelt represented different parties, they did both pursue progressive politics. Senator John Kennedy of Massachusetts, Democrat, throws his hat in the presidential ring at a Washington press conference. The Kennedys took nepotism to a whole new level. After Democrat John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960, he appointed his brother Bobby Attorney General. I know the great problems of law enforcement that face all of us as American citizens. But I think a great deal can be done in this area and in many other areas. Five years after JFK was assassinated, Robert Kennedy ran for the White House himself and was also shot and killed. A third brother, Ted, had been elected Massachusetts Senator, taking JFK's old Senate seat and was seen as likely to run for the White House in 1972 until the scandal of Chappaquiddick delayed his presidential bid until 1980. The Romneys, Father George and son Mitt, both served as state governors and both ran unsuccessfully for president. But probably the real Republican answer to the Kennedys came from another old New England family, the Bushes. Prescott Bush was elected senator from Connecticut in 1952. His son George Bush lost a Senate race before being elected to Congress in 1966. Uh, I have tried to campaign on the issues, keeping the campaign out of the gutter, hitting my opponent on his voting record, uh, but re uh, staying away from hitting him on a very personal basis. George Bush ran for president, but had to settle for the vice presidency in 1980, finally winning the White House in his own right in 1988. His son, George Walker Bush, was elected Texas so governor in 1994 and president in 2000. Another son, Jeb, was elected governor of Florida in 1998 and ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination in 2016. I think the next president needs to be a lot quieter, but send a signal that we're prepared to act in the national security interests of this country to get back in the business of creating a more peaceful world. Please clap. That was also the year that former First Lady, Senator and Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton ran for the presidency for the second time, almost a quarter of a century after her husband Bill had defeated George Bush for the White House. But both Hillary and Jeb found that while their names opened doors and wallets, it was hard to live up to sky-high expectations. And I hope you'll join me on this journey. The prospect of a revolving door presidency between two established political dynasties proved too much for American voters, and they turned to a complete outsider, businessman Donald Trump. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I the old thing. So, is America going to create a new political dynasty after casting aside the Bushes and the Clintons? You can imagine if Don Jr. actually ran, he'd be doing so with his father's strong endorsement, political contacts, and perhaps most importantly, financial backing. Time will tell if enough Americans want a second President Trump, although we don't yet know if they're finished with the first one. And that is it for another action-packed week on Planet America. You can find longer interviews, extra features and past programs on ABC, iView, Facebook and YouTube. Mm. But before we go, we're going to leave you with the extraordinary lengths that one Democratic senator, John Hickenlooper, went to to promote the For the People Act, S1, even composing his own anthem for it. 
Not sure it's gonna work, <laughs> but enjoy. Bye bye. In the Senate, we call the People's Act. It gives power to the voters and not those corporate packs. This bill will make it easy for voters to have their say. So let's get make elections fairer and pass S one two.